This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Spencer Brudig. I'm Will Johnson. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. When we realized that her social media was not active for over 12 hours, we were like, okay, this is not right. This story immediately went beyond a headline and went into people's timelines. People started following her. They wanted, it, you're, it's, it's amazing how you can get so personal with someone who's not even with us anymore. So we're all just very confused. We need answers. We're going to get them. No one gets away with something like this. No one. 26-year-old Alexis Sharkey cataloged her life on social media. Her skincare routine, her diet, vacations with her husband, and memories with friends. <laughs> Wait. Oh, I got that. This is my hobby. Okay, so I don't think everyone understands how good at zip lining we are. <laughs> it's something most of us do, at least to some extent. But for Alexis, it wasn't just a means to share vacation photos or keep friends and family updated on her life. It was a living. She'd worked for years to grow her social media audiences, turning those channels into a legitimate marketing platform with tens of thousands of followers. According to friends, that's how she supported herself. She was an influencer, someone who had, as she puts it in her Instagram bio, retired the nine to five. Okay, so my full name is Melissa Correa, and I'm a reporter in Houston, Texas. Melissa Correa has been covering Alexis Sharkey's story for KHOU in Houston. So Alexis Sharkey was a social media influencer. She's this 26-year-old who really documented her life very well on social media. She was prevalent on TikTok. She had a very full Instagram page where she would post pictures with her friends, with her activities, with her travel, and she would often update her stories. Alexis worked with a hair and skincare company that pitches itself on its website as a social marketing company where the more you're able to network and influence other people, the more product you're able to sell. Maybe not a model that works for everyone, but apparently it was going pretty well for Alexis. And from what I gather, one of the reasons why she was just so successful at selling hair care and skin care with the company is because she really tapped into that. Her friends say like, this is how she made her money. She was um, kind of an advocate. Like she enjoyed mentoring people on social media about ways to live their life holistically with health, wellness, and beauty. And her friends described her as this determined, hardcore ray of light who rose through the ranks of the company, becoming an executive director. But she's young. She's a college graduate. Her parents confirmed that she grew up in Pennsylvania. She had a biology degree. And as far as we knew, friends said the sky was the limit for Alexis Sharkey. Getting to the fall of 2020, Alexis was living in Houston with her husband. So she moved to Houston with her 40-something-year-old husband in January of 2020. And it's also interesting how she was able to make friends three months prior to the pandemic in the fourth largest city of the country. But prior to Houston, she was on the other side of Texas. She was in West Texas. And from what we gather from talking to Alexis's friends, she met her husband, Tom Sharkey, there in West Texas. And for a brief stint, maybe just a few months or so, the couple lived in Colorado, but they were relatively new to the space city, moving in January 2020 here. She moved here in January and we met, I mean, within weeks of her moving here. This is one of Alexis Sharkey's friends, Tanya Ricardo, in an interview with Melissa Correa. She was always happy, always had a smile on her face. A lot of people looked up to her. She was just very, very positive. And that's exactly how other friends who've spoken with KHOU describe Alexis. Someone who's positive, motivated, ambitious, and a supportive friend. She was just like a light of the room. Like she was, she was just so smart and just so funny. She's grown to be such a good friend to me. And I just can't believe she's gone. They describe her as this girl who moved to Houston, had no friends, not a, knew a single soul, and wanted to do something about that. So she used a friendship app, and she made friends with a bunch of girls, about a handful of them, before the pandemic. And then their friendship kind of evolved and really grew out of the pandemic. By the sound of it, the friend group was pretty much always in contact. If not in person, then over social media or via text. She was in massive group texts with her girlfriends. I mean, who isn't? Especially during this pandemic. And so from what I gather from talking with her friends, she celebrated Thanksgiving with her girlfriends. She was actually at my house on Thanksgiving. We spent Thanksgiving together with my family. In fact, we have what might very well be the last photo taken of Alexis Sharkey alive. And there she is with two other gals just after Thanksgiving, celebrating the holiday together. Not shown in that photo is Alexis's husband, Tom. I made sure to ask if Tom Sharkey was at Thanksgiving with Alexis. And Tanya Ricardo, who's in that last photo with Alexis, said no. That she had shown up to Thanksgiving to celebrate with her friends alone. That was just this past Thanksgiving day, Thursday, November 26th, 2020. 
And according to Alexis's friends, the group planned to get together again over the weekend. Her friends wanted to continue that going, right? What, were, what else were you going to do? Couldn't do Black Friday shopping. Things were kind of quieted down because of COVID-19. So her girl, so Alexis Sharkey apparently reached out in a group text with her girlfriends, trying to make plans for Friday. And so she texted her friend, Tanya Ricardo, and said, hey, are you doing anything? Do you have any plans? Do you want to get together? And Tanya, who's a mother, said she was going to kind of rein it in and hang out with her family on Friday. But the weather on Saturday was going to be dreary. It was going to be cold. It was going to be rainy. And so Tanya said and posed this idea to Alexis in texts, how about we all get together on Saturday and start like a movie marathon? Alexis, from the text messages that I saw in that conversation, said that was awesome. She wished her friend well. And the conversation was then and there. That's when the weekend takes a turn. Her friends noticed that the near constant stream of posts on Alexis Sharkey's social media accounts, all the photos, the TikTok videos, story updates, all of it stops. And the social media presence is what really, boom, raised red flags early into this investigation because her friend said Alexis wouldn't go more than a few hours without posting. This was business to her. This is how she made her money. This is how she earned a living. So she wanted to make sure that she was generating content online so that she could continue keeping a base and growing her followers. When we realized that her social media was not active for over 12 hours, we were like, okay, this is not right. right. And then there was the group chat, which picked back up again that Saturday morning. The conversation continued throughout the friends. Okay, what time are we going to meet for the movies? What are we going to do? Everybody come in your PJs. And Alexis isn't chiming in at all. And friend Tanya Ricardo says, Alexis is normally the first person to respond to the group chat. Alexis would have been the first person to respond. And she didn't. The last time I spoke to her was Friday around six o'clock. There wasn't any obvious explanation for Alexis not to be posting on social media or responding to her friend's messages. And as far as her friends knew, she was home that Saturday. It's pouring rain. If you could be out on the streets in Houston, you're not because it's just no fun to be out on the road. So the friends wake up. They start realizing that Alexis hasn't posted on social media. They realize Alexis has not responded to the group texts. So around 2.30, 2 o'clock that afternoon, Tanya Ricardo, Alexis's friend, drives to her apartment in West Houston and does a welfare check. But when they get there, Alexis isn't home and neither is Tom. And so Tanya and her friend get nervous. They end up calling the Houston Police Department. Police officers show up. And according to Tanya, just as Houston police arrive to take down this report, Tom Sharkey appears. Tom Sharkey tells police and Alexis's friends that he had gone to the gym, he had run some errands, that he and Alexis had maybe gotten into some sort of heated heated argument and she had walked off. And he was giving her some space. Initially, uh, he reportedly was not worried about Alexis's whereabouts. Um, And Houston police confirmed this as well. But this explanation doesn't ease all of the friend's concerns. After all, if Alexis had stormed off and maybe just needed some space... Wouldn't she still at least have her phone? No one had any idea where her phone was. And Tanya Ricardo told me specifically that she had continued to text Alexis. And the, and the interesting thing about texting your friend, regardless if they answer or not, especially if you have an iPhone, is you can kind of get a sense of if the message is going through, if the phone is on, right? It says messages delivered. And she said by Sunday morning, the messages were not going through. Between the friends and Tom Sharkey, a missing persons report is filed that Saturday. And soon, Tom also begins to express some concern on his social media accounts. So once Tom Sharkey filed the missing persons report, he did post and begin to post on his Facebook page. You know, what we are used to seeing, I think, as Americans when someone goes missing, right? Uh, These beautiful photo tributes, Facebook posts saying, I can't believe she's gone. Please pray, find my wife. We started to see this. And then within 24 hours, Tom Sharkey's post took a turn. He started to get defensive about what people normally do, which is strangers, bots, trolls, and sleuths trying to solve the case before police do. And with that, some people, I guess, were leaving some not-so-nice comments on Tom Sharkey's public Instagram and Facebook pages. And it quickly turned from focusing on the disappearance of his wife and finding her to him shutting down critics. That same Saturday morning, the morning after Alexis Sharkey goes dark on social media and stops responding to her friend's text messages and hours before she'd be reported missing, a city of Houston sanitation worker had spotted something during his morning shift. We spoke with the city of Houston solid waste supervisor, John Richardson, and he recounts this really disturbing discovery. It plays back in my head. You know, it's been playing back in my head every day. One of his employees had driven up this road and had thought, Mm, that doesn't look right. Said he thought he seen a body or a mannequin, so he wasn't for sure. He wasn't gonna stop because he was kind of, you know, know that you know he was scared or whatever case may be. So he asked me to come out there and check it out. Richardson heads out to the scene and quickly sees that it's not a mannequin, it's a body. So as we was driving, we could see the feet, you know. So we we got out and looked, and there it was. You know, she was laying there, uh, deceased, 
Uh, she was no clothes on. Richardson finds the body. He sees that it's this beautiful woman. She's naked and she's dead. And I just got on the phone. And I called 911. Law enforcement shows up and begins an investigation. But at this point, they have little information as to who this woman was, let alone how she died. I remember speaking to um, Houston police detective Rivera, and he told me flat out there at the crime scene a couple of days later that her body didn't look to be concealed. There's some brush in this empty lot, you know, some overgrown trees, some fallen tree limbs. He said there was no effort to try to conceal her body. It appeared as though somebody had just pushed her out of a vehicle and she had been dumped. There were no signs of her clothing, of her shoes, of anything like that, nothing identifying that led them to believe this was Alexis Sharkey early on in the day. Houston police are investigating the death of a woman whose nude body was found on the side of the road. Police say a public works employee discovered the body off Red Hall Lane near I-10 at about 8 o'clock this morning. They say she had no visible injuries. The medical examiner will determine the cause of death and ID. We covered that as its own story. And then Saturday night, when we got word that Alexis Sharkey had been reported missing, we covered that disappearance totally separate, not realizing until a couple of days later that they were the same person. The body was identified as Alexis Sharkey. And the location where it was found was only about three miles away from her apartment, the apartment where her husband said he last saw her storm off on foot. And one of the first questions Melissa Correa has for law enforcement is if it looks like Alexis might have gotten to that location on foot or if her body had been dumped there. I specifically asked Houston police if they believed Alexis Sharkey may have walked off the property, right? Her husband is telling police the day the missing persons report is filed, we got in an argument, she took off. Well, there are a couple of security cameras at the apartment complex, and Houston police could only tell me that the furthest Alexis Sharkey went was to the front of the apartment complex. They do not believe that she went walking off the property, they do not believe that she was picked up by anybody, and they definitely don't believe that she was walking along the side of the road where her body was found, because that that is perpendicular with an interstate, with I-10. And there's just no way on a rainy Saturday that anybody would be out there, especially a woman who wasn't dressed for the elements. Police also say they believe, based on the condition of the body, it had been dumped on the side of the road late Friday night or early Saturday morning. But after this initial flurry of events, the flow of information to the media and to the public pretty much stops. Houston police have been incredibly tight-lipped about this investigation. I mean, when I say I've called Detective Rivera a couple of times, I mean it, him and Detective Young, who were handling this case. And initially, we thought HPD was playing this close to the vest because they had a suspect, right? When they don't need the media's help, it's usually because an arrest is around the corner. But more than six weeks into the launch of this investigation, they have not held one press conference. They have not had one big media event. They have not even said that they have a person of interest, which is just so bizarre in an investigation like this. Um, but again, I think it just speaks to the fact that she had this presence on social media. And when you're in front of potentially thousands of people, I mean, it, it truly can be a needle in a haystack. As the police remain tight-lipped, Melissa Correa and other reporters at KHOU reach out to family and friends for more information. But one person they're still not quite able to get in touch with is Tom Sharkey. I text messaged him. I can't even tell you how many times. And I know that my text messages were re received. You know, I also got that infamous text bubble where I could see that he saw my message and was considering writing something and then never got a response. Others, however, including some of Alexis's friends, have been more willing to talk. In talking with Alexis's friends who say this woman was looking forward to Christmas and the new year and all of these new business opportunities that were just around the corner, they believe Alexis was a victim of foul play. Without a doubt in my mind, and foul play was involved, and this was a murder. Alexis Sharkey's mom, Stacey Robineau, would also say she believed foul play was involved. I, I will talk about my daughter all day, as a mom would. Grace White, another reporter at KHOU, and someone you've actually heard on this podcast in the past, interviews Stacey at length, just a few days after her daughter had been found dead. Alexis was a, a, a ray of sunshine. She was fun. Um, anytime she was in a gathering with people, she was she was just fun. She knew how to make it fun. Uh, she'd get the gatherings going. Um, she would make people feel good about themselves. Um, she was very warm, very inviting. She was truly beautiful inside and out, um, very playful. Uh, and, uh, and on top of all that, she was very smart, and very driven. She graduated summa cum laude with a biology degree. And um, she, she, just, she was a smart cookie, a very strong thinker, analytical, all around, truly. I, I'm sorry, I know it's a mama bragging, but she really was. She was just, she was just wonderful. Did you have any idea that she had such a following on social media? You know, it's so funny. Um, no, uh, I don't pay attention to that. I have to be honest. I don't even really like social media very much, to be truthful. And I mean, I knew she had a following and I knew she, I mean, the following, she, it wasn't her intention to be an influencer. I keep seeing that. And that frustrates me because my daughter, my daughter built a business. She was driven and she was goal driven and she was building a business and she was using a platform. Um, but the side thing that came out of it was she began, began to influence as well. Um, and so I just want to say that because I just think it's important. 
I just think it's important to, um, to, to talk about that part of her. The last time Stacey Robineau had heard from her daughter was the Thursday before she went missing, Thanksgiving Day. I last spoke with her by text on Thanksgiving. We were just texting back and forth. You know, happy Thanksgiving, love you, miss you. You know, we were planning on when she was coming for Christmas. And then on Friday is when she disappeared and I never talked to her after Thanksgiving. A little later in the interview, Grace White asked the question that a lot of you are probably wondering right now. What do you think happened to your daughter? Oh, you know, I can, I can speculate and my mind can spin all day long. Um, I don't know. And I, I won't speculate because I, I want the police to not have me messing up any investigation. Because what is most important to me is that it's solved and justice is found for Alexis. And so I will, I will give you the human side of my child all day long, but I don't know what happened. But I do know it was not an accident. Yeah, I think you've said in the past that you believe it was murder. Do you still stand by that statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I don't doubt it at all. As the investigation continued, weeks would go by without a ruling from the medical examiner as to Alexis Sharkey's cause of death. The medical examiner is still working to determine the cause of death for 26-year-old Alexis Sharkey. The medical Sharkey. examiner has not yet Saturday. ruled on her cause of death. The medical examiner is working to determine how Alexis Sharkey died. But the died. biggest question is still unanswered. How did she die? What happened to Alexis Sharkey? But finally... The same day I spoke with Melissa Correa, just recently, on January 19th, 2021, the medical examiner confirmed a cause of death. December 1st, I sent the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office an email saying that I was following the death of Alexis Sharkey and that at that point on December 1st, it said her cause of death was pending. So I asked at that point, how long is this going to take? When can you give me an answer? So the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office just responded to that email. There are new developments in the death of a popular social media blogger, Alexis Sharkey. An autopsy reveals she was strangled. And now we know the truth. The Harris County Medical Examiner officially ruling her cause of death as strangulation and the manner homicide. 12.35 p.m. Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. The Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences has determined the cause of death for Alexis Lee Robinault Sharkey was strangulation. The manner is homicide. The autopsy report will be available after law enforcement concludes includes its case. A case, an investigation, that is still ongoing. And one that, as of the release of this episode, law enforcement hasn't offered much other information about publicly. Right now, the investigation is wide open, right? And for good reason. Houston police have yet to say anything. So as far as we know, this case has not gone cold. As far as we know, the Houston Police Department is working this investigation to the point that it doesn't yet need the public's help. Think about when police release little tidbits to the public. It's because they need help finding a car. They need help finding a person of interest. They're looking for surveillance video. And then we can kind of figure out where they are hot on the tail. But they have not said anything. And so this leads me to believe that this case is not cold, that Houston police still have enough information to chase on their own without asking the public for help. But of course, we won't know until we know. She had a life and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Pune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is The Yellow Car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. Joining me to chat a little bit more about this week's case, as always, are Will Johnson and Spencer Brittig. Guys, again, where this case stands now, Nobody has been named publicly as a suspect. There haven't been any arrests. It's an open case. And that means there are unfortunately a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of things we could discuss. But I wanted to start off by talking a little more about one of the things that makes this story so unique. And it's that Alexis Sharkey was this social media influencer, if we want to use that term. She had this big following. She was incredibly active on social media channels. And one of the reasons it makes this story unique is that people have been actually going back through her Instagram or her TikTok or whatever and sort of getting to know her in that way even after her death. Yeah, I mean, I actually want to talk a little bit about the social media side of this. I mean, it kind of permeates the whole thing. It, this really is a very modern case in the sense of, you know, she herself was a social media influencer. Her friends and family became concerned because she wasn't posting on social media for a certain period of time, and that was suspicious. Um, then her, her husband, Tom's social media, you know, kind of tonal changes uh, that uh, kind of made people look at him in a different way. Uh, and, and now, Reed, I think that uh, all of these kind of pieces of social media are a big player and factor in the evidence of this case, right? Yeah, everything that's out there that we can see, every post that that Alexis made public is now evidence. Law enforcement also has that. And you can bet they're looking through all of it to see if something in there may have played a role in her death. You know, not to take away from the, the story, the core of this story, because it's so tragic and, and awful, and hopefully we'll hear something from law enforcement soon. But there's this one little element of this story that struck me as like a side note. And it was the, the voice of the guy talking about finding her body. Yeah. 
it's this part of like crimes that maybe we don't talk about all that much or, you know, murders or violent crimes where there's so many lives affected down to the people that come across a body doing their everyday job. And it's like, you know, that that has to be frozen in their minds for forever. Yeah. I mean, that's a traumatic experience for anyone, let alone someone who obviously didn't sign up for this when they got a job with the city of Houston. Well, it has a lot of elements. It has like, you know, there, there's that. And then there's the social media aspect of it. There's the fact that, you know, anyone can now go, as you guys were discussing, go find out, learn more about her. Um, there's the police not really saying anything, which, you know, you're the reporter here in the story you know, covers pretty well. But it is a really interesting aspect of this. You'd think they'd come out and say something, especially someone that's sort of well known, right? Right. And that's something Melissa touched on a little bit, too, is maybe that suggests that law enforcement has an idea of what might have happened, or they at least have a lot of active leads that they, it seems, don't need the public's help. With a lot of cases that we've covered, You'll hear law enforcement say, you know, we have security footage. It shows a black car or something like that driving away from the scene. And the goal there is to get the public to call in and say, oh, I saw, you know, a car. I saw something suspicious. They're not offering those little bits of evidence to the public in this case, which makes you think they they have a lot to go on already. Reed, I know we heard from Grace White and some of her interview. Uh, you can hear more of that interview, right? Yeah, that is, of course, the interview Grace did with Alexis Sharkey's mom. And it is a longer interview. We weren't able to put all of it in this episode, but you can hear all of it on KHOU's website. And it's it's well worth checking out. It's a really moving conversation. I know one of the things I was personally struck by listening to that longer version of the interview was Alexis's mom talking about you know, what it means to her to see people getting to know her daughter in her daughter's own words from her social media accounts. And I don't want to misquote her or anything. So it's, it's worth going and checking out the full interview. Again, it's on KHOU's website. It's maybe 10 or 12 minutes. All right, Reed, thanks for all your work on this episode. And Melissa Correo at KHOU. Uh, Spencer, where can people go to learn more about our show? We have a Facebook group that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with called Inside the Crime Vault. It is on Facebook. Uh, please join us there where we would discuss uh, this case and other cases like it with uh, lots of true crime fans. All right, for True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson along with Reed Redmond and Spencer Brudig. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.